Hello, my name is Donald Cruz. I'm a reference librarian at the Del High Township branch, the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County. Today I'm interviewing uh, Mr. John Hamlet, who um, it is November the 9th, 2006. We are at the Del High Township branch of the Public Library, and he and I are the only people present. John, thank you very much for agreeing to do this. Oh, you're welcome. We, uh, we certainly appreciate it. We're glad to have this opportunity to let some of our veterans tell their different stories, and I, as I've said, I'm certainly getting an interesting range. Your, your background will certainly be a, a very unique. Uh, let's get a little bit of that background. You are not a native Cincinnatian, so say I know you were from New England, right. Right. Um, which would be a little different than I think some of the people. Of course, uh, families do move around and so on. Uh, your service is so very unique, I think, in at least what you were connected to, which of course was the OSS, the, which is properly the Office of Strategic Services. Strategic Services, the precursor of the Central Intelligence Agency, correct? Um, of the uh, CIA, right. Yeah. Um, it's called that ordinarily, right? Not a direct link, but, but it's, it's what we had before. Uh, and that was in a group that was actually created during World War II, correct? That's right, by General William Donovan as an intelligence organization although the particular branch that I was in, the operational group, uh, was uh, uh, an oper was a uh, combat group, actually. Okay. Uh, so let, let's let's talk about about how you got into this and so on. You're the, here in your your uh, biographical background. You told me that you uh, went into service in 1935. Correct. That's correct. So that's when you said you finished college and you, and you went directly into service, 1935 since military? Well, I went into the reserve at that when, time. Okay, went into the reserve. I actually was on active duty only for two month periods okay. uh, to fulfill the requirements of the reserves until extended active duty came along at the time of 19, uh, at the time of World War II, which was in, I went in October of um, 42. Okay, uh, you were an officer? You were a commissioned officer, which uh, that's the first time I've actually speak to an officer since I've been doing these interviews, so that's great. Um, and so specifically, you were in the medical corps. That's what, right. What was your background that put you into the medical corps? Well, after college, I went to uh, medical school. Okay. I went to McGill Medical School. Got in Canada? Degree, and I put in a couple of years of uh, intern and residency training and uh, then went on active duty. Okay, so you were a physician, by you were a trained physician, you were involved in the, the um, reserves to that time period. That's right. And um, so when the call up came, you were amongst the, you were certainly being called up right. uh, for full time active duty after, sometime after Pearl Harbor, correct? Right. Okay. Yeah. No, I was put into a, a hospital unit. It was a general hospital, and it was one of, uh, of three actually in Boston. Uh, two were called to active duty okay. while I sat uh, d doing odds and ends of medical work. And uh, I finally went on active duty with, with this general hospital, uh, but I was on separate duty. The hospital still wasn't uh, mobilized, and uh, I was transferred from Fort Camp Edwards and, uh, on the Cape of Massachusetts to Fort Evans and back again to the Cape. And I got Where's Fort Evans? Pardon? Where was Fort Evans? Uh, uh, Fort Devons. Devons? Devons. Okay. Where was that? Recently deactivated in the town of Ayer, A-Y-E-R, Massachusetts. Also Massachusetts, right. okay. And uh, when I went back to uh, uh, war duty, which was interesting, but not exactly what I was anticipating on you know, active duty with the Army. <laughs> uh, incidentally, I'd gotten my uh, initial commission in field artillery. Okay. Uh, but, uh, As did many people. I didn't uh -huh. realize that transferring to the medical corps was going to be a wait. At any rate, uh, it was at that time at Camp Edwards that I made a move to, to do something different, uh, follow from the uh, OSS came along looking for volunteers and, uh, out of curiosity, went to listen to them. And, uh, did 
did they very clearly tell you what it was they intended to do, the sort of... Um, well, he, he said uh, uh, there were operations that might involve uh, dangerous activities, but uh, that was as far as he went. And, and uh, that was as far as uh, I had to commit myself by saying, yeah, I was still interested. Okay. <laughs> and um, he said, well, uh, that's all for now. We had met in the adjutant's office at Camp Edwards. Uh, he said, I'll see you this afternoon at uh, 1400 hours. I went back to the adjutant's office. He, I never saw him again. Right. But in a couple of uh, weeks, got my orders to, uh, go to, to go to Washington. Okay, so if, if that's, that's where they sent the people that's who were going to be prepared to, to be that's part of the OSS. Okay, so you went to Washington. So at that time passed, you went to Washington. And they had been looking for a medical <laughs> officer to go with this particular French operational group. Okay. And uh, that was it. And that was the time when I met the greatest guys I've ever known. Now, this is, what? when are we talking about? This is 42, 43? This was uh, 43. Okay. I went on active duty in October 42. Okay. And made this change to the uh, OSS in 43. Okay. So you went to Washington, and I assume there was additional training That's right. for the nature of this unusual I work was, you were? I was joined to the Trent group, which had already received their um, training in small weapons activity, demolitions, uh, personal combat, individual combat. Uh, I went in just in time to go with the group to Camp Hale, Colorado for ski training. Okay. The objective was to have some skiers who could be dropped into Jerusalem, into uh, Switzerland. Right. So we went to uh, Camp Hill for a couple of weeks, over one Christmas and New Year's. It was very chilly there, and uh, came back. Uh, eventually, uh, in the late winter, uh, we were transferred to North Africa. <laughs> well, your skiing was probably not terribly helpful. <laughs> took our skis and our, uh, our uh, used them to support the mosquito nets <laughs> okay. that they provided for Of course, us. of course. Right. Uh, so, as a medical officer, though, you got full training along with the other fellows in weaponry? Skiing. Okay, no. not in weaponry. No, okay. I didn't know anything about weapons. Okay. No, but they did. They, they were well trained. Okay. And, uh, and as a full fledged physician, you were probably a little beyond the normal training of most medical people. We were, Was that intentional to have somebody with? We were well supplied with uh, uh, so called medics. Right. And they had received medical training already. This unit was ready to go. But and they turned out to be a great group of. Medics. But those medics are more like what we call like EMTs today, or that sort of training, rather than being, yes, yes. being medically right. medical personnel, being nurses or, or physicians, right? Right. Okay, so North, here we go to North Africa, and what happened? What, what were you? Uh, why were you in North Africa? What was the that assignment? Well, uh, we then waited to see what the uh, armies were going to do next. Uh, and while we were there, we took jump training. Okay, where were, what was going on at this point for the American troops? Had we already, were we already in, obviously we were in North Africa, you wouldn't have been in North Africa. Had we already run Rommel out of, all the way back? That's right. Okay, so yeah. basically we demilitar most the, of North uh, Africa was demilitarized. The Army uh, was out of North Africa. Okay. Uh, they had uh, just taken Sicily and were going into, they were in uh, Italy. Okay. So they're heading up the up at, up the heading north, right in, in Italy, the boot of Italy, fighting the uh, German army there, as well as the fascists. That had so what's left of the Italian right, force? Exactly. exactly. So you're still waiting. So you're waiting in North Africa. So what did they finally right. decide? Um, and they, you got jump training. I'm sorry. So right. you learned to jump out and of airplane. We're ready to go in the, in the French. Okay. And on uh, D-Day uh, in Normandy. June 6th, uh, the first group went out, and that's where this friend uh, that I spoke about uh, 
was the first one to go in with his section. This a, is a section of Car uh, Colonel Cox. Uh, was Art, Art Frizzell. He was a lieutenant. Okay. Uh, Art Frizzell with his uh, combat section of uh, uh, 14 men and two officers. And, and where did they go in? They jumped into southwestern France over toward the Swiss border. Okay. Uh, this was all German controlled. Right. Uh, although there wasn't as much activity as, as in uh, North France, right. Northern France. But it was uh, occupied by Germany. Okay. So then what happened? So that, so that was one and of the groups they, you would... They carried out their mission there. Okay. Uh, their missions were mostly interrupting communication lines, uh, blowing bridges, and uh, using their explosives around other places like uh, buildings. Where they Obviously, this is fully covert, a very small unit. I assume working, right. with the resi working with the French resistance or on Working with French resistance. French oh, resistance. Yes. Okay. Yep. So that's the other group. So what happened to your group? What happened to your operational group? Uh, my group jumped later in June uh, into uh, southern France, south of Lyon, in a place called Devassay. Devassay. And uh, okay. I, I can remember <coughs> all the jumps were at night. I can remember coming down and uh, seeing the explosions over uh, in a city. On the Rhone River, we were we landed west of the Rhone, okay, and that was our base in De Devassay. But still, this is German-controlled territory, well oh, yes. behind enemy oh, yes. lines. All the fellows lived in the woods and stayed away from public roads and communities. Right. So, actually. Uh, Major Cox, he was at that time, he, he was the head of the section that I went in with. Okay. He spent his time contacting other groups that had been in there a number of days. Other OSS groups. That's right. Okay. That's right. And trying to coordinate their activities and especially coordinate the activity of each group with the uh, French resistance. Okay. And. Uh, that was accomplished well. Well, so, so tell me some of the things that were happening. I and mean, when you say, what sort of things did your group do? I mean, what do you actually remember being involved in? What, uh, uh, what sort of covert activity do you actually, I mean, did you go when people went to cut lines or did you kind of hang back in case they needed medical? I mean, were you, you, yes. kinda, you were more, a little right. more stationary than probably some of the other people in your yes, exactly. immediate group. Right. Well, um, one day we, uh, took off and went over to the Rhone River, okay. uh, going in back roads, and looked down on the Rhone and let the highway and the north-south highway and just watched the German troops heading north along the highway. Well, our commanding officer reported that right away. Right. And uh, so they tried to bomb them right away. There, um, Camouflage was was good, uh, but uh, it, it was effective. It, it held some of the um, troops, the German troops, from getting farther north to, to help the uh, uh, armies that were coming in from the north, the British army under Montgomery and the American army, right. under Patton and another general. Did you actually, at that point, were you actually having to do much medical work? Were there are many injuries or uh, so on with the people uh, in your operational group? Uh, injuries, injuries had taken place, and they had done a good job. There was one fellow that had, had uh, his thigh extensively exposed, and uh, uh, our medics took care of him, and there happened to be a uh, hospital uh, uh, at a nearby community, uh, where he he would he was entered, mm -hmm. uh, Sergeant Billado, and he, he stayed there. He didn't get into active work again. All I could do there was go and observe that he was being well taken care of. Right. 
Um, now, was this still behind the lines? That he was when he was in this hospital. Was this hospital behind the lines? I and mean, was this in? That's a, right. A French, in, French it's hospital. a French hospital in a German-controlled area. That's right. Exactly. That's kind of, That's very covert. <laughs> well, yeah. No. Uh, the second group that went in uh, wasn't quite so lucky. Uh, Hopper's group. Uh, they, his second in command, Lieutenant Myers had appendicitis or was taken into a hospital there. And uh, it was an, an area that the Germans moved into after they heard that there was an American unit there. They came in uh, by parachute, by uh, uh, plane, and uh, overran that area and uh, took this fellow. He ended up in prison in Germany, Chet Myers. He survived. Talked to him on the telephone after the war. He lived in Texas. Mm -hmm. right. So, okay, but so there were casualties, uh, and some of them severe. So, okay, so that was your that was your base operation at that point. It was along the Rhone. That's right. What happened? Rhone, the Rhone. And where do we go from there? Did you continue? We were overrun by uh, the. American Army coming in from the, the, the south, you don't hear so much about that line, uh, landing. But the troops that had come in in southern France. Yep, southern France, that right. was General Patch, that was later in June. He, right. He came into southern France and headed north. And uh, he, it, it was done very quickly. Um, we, we think that we may have helped in doing that, that is the operational groups had done. Uh, good job. Also, there were other groups in the OSI, uh, OSS, SI, for instance, the Secret Intelligence. And, uh, Is that more more traditional spying so sort that of? Was, that was emphasis was on intelligence there. I assume so that was in smaller spying, spying, even smaller groups of men. So, Southern France was well known by the American Army going on. Uh, the American Army went up on one side of the Rhone River. The French Army what was left of it, it went north on the other side of the river, which was our side. And when we were overrun, there was nothing else for us to do. Okay. So Major Cox, then Major Cox, uh, got the groups together. Uh, we, uh, oh, we, we went with the <laughs> invading armies into Lyon, just, just uh, went along for the, for, the, for the ride. They did all the work. Leon was freed, and uh, then uh, Cox assembled us in Grenoble, which was uh, in Switzerland, so farther south of Leon and west of the Rhone, uh, east of the Rhone River. And there we waited for a number of weeks till it's Grenoble, French, or Grenoble's France, not no, France. Switzerland, it's Switzerland, France. Yeah, we waited me. there for a number of weeks, and uh, then learned, learned that we had been picked to go to China. Okay, so, that's certainly a change of venue. So we had a, uh, uh, a few months in there. We didn't start for China until February, just after February, in March of... Uh, 45. 40, 45. Okay. Yes. And uh, the uh, rest of, of our operational group went over uh, to Kunming and settled outside... Repeat that again? Kunming. 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 Southwest Kunming. China. Okay. Right. And uh, we had locations outside, just outside of the city. And uh, our mission there was to train Chinese troops to do the same as the operational group fellows were doing. Okay. Uh, first, the, uh, the, the um, airborne type of uh, branch of, of OSS was on hand, gave the Chinese jump training, okay. and they went after that. They were a proud group. And uh, uh, the objective was to train at least 3,000. Well, when we got 1,000 ready, they were ready for action. Right. And uh, went, went into action against Japanese uh, locations. Right. And uh, 
in the time that was left that summer, uh, the, uh, those units started going in in uh, August and September uh, to spots where there were Japanese that could be attacked or in a position to be attacked. The, uh, the Japanese were along the coast of China. Right. Uh, not so many of them. They didn't have control of the inland cities such as Kunming and Chongqing. Uh, so these uh, targets were down uh, in southwest China, closer to the coast. Right. And uh, when the atom bomb dropped, three of these uh, so-called commandos had gone into action. Each commando had uh, 150 Chinese individuals and uh, a dozen or so American operational group fellows going along with them. And two of them went in along, in along the uh, South River, which is a river heading north and uh, west from, from Canton. Okay. And uh, got those fellows moving farther down the river. They went into combat. Right. Uh, there. And uh, another one went up uh, on a branch of the uh, West River to, a, to another group of Japanese uh, and uh, uh, went into action against them. So there was a fair amount of... Change fire. They, so there's still a fair amount of, China, of Japanese strength in China, even though we were taking the islands as we had, oh, as yes. Americans were taking the islands as we headed north, oh, there yes. was still a, a, oh, yes. a large right. Chinese, a large Japanese right. force along the coast, along coastal China and well into Manchuria, right? Exactly. Okay. So the uh, uh, leaders of OSS wanted uh, trained troops inland, uh, such as in western China, where we were, uh, to push the, uh, work their way toward the coast and get information about coastal spots uh, preparatory to landing of Allied troops along the China coast. And this was done. In addition to operational groups, the so-called SO groups, special operation groups. One of uh, uh, my good friends in the uh, operational group was picked out to go down to uh, the vicinity of Hainan, H-A-I-N-A-N. You saw that uh, written up in the paper several, a few years ago when uh, an American plane went down. Was it observation? That's right. Is that right? Okay. Yes, I remember yeah. reconnaissance plane and yeah. So he was going down to see what there was down there, and he, he got information and reported back, and there actually was a Japanese uh, unit in on the island. Right. Of course, during the war. So that was our. And what were you doing? What was the group you were with doing while you were in China? Actually, where, where did you actually uh, Art Frizzell's group down on the West River? He had gone into action against the Japanese. He had uh, about a dozen casualties. Uh, fortunately, most of them minor, and his medics had done a great job taking care of those. There were a number of Japanese wounded, and uh, we took care of those. Now, those uh, did not survive, all of them. Uh, there were all degrees of injuries there. And uh, uh, that's where I was. Uh, they called for a medical officer to go down, and I flew down there. Down? Down to a place that was called Tanchuk, T-A-N-C-H-U-K. That's where Frizzell had gone into action. Okay. And driven the Japanese father down the river, and they had, had some, suffered some casualties, too. And um, this was in an airfield. Mm -hmm which General Chennault had used earlier, but okay. the Japanese had pushed him Take back, okay. back in. And uh, two other fellows and I uh, took that trip down day after the um, action. And uh, B, the B-24 was going to land if there were no bomb craters, but there were. So we jumped and landed right on the <coughs> airstrip. And, uh, 
Good aim. Uh, so we stayed there. We met uh, uh, priests coming in from the mountains, and we occupied the buildings that they had occupied before the Japanese had pushed them out into the mountains. Okay. And we were there uh, a couple of weeks when action was stopped by the atom bomb. And that was the, that was the end of our Chinese experience. So I'm probably just showing my ignorance. So uh, w the, the atom bombs dropped, the emperor surrenders, and basically I guess all the troops there surrendered in China, the Japanese troops surrendered as far as they could, as, as fast as they as, discovered, as, as soon as they could convince them that the war mm -hmm. was over. That really was the emperor speaking. Has anybody ever heard the emperor, etc.? It took a while. You know, one of the uh, uh, met, uh, one of the uh, doctors who had come in after I did, uh, he went on a mission actually, and had time to come back and get another immediate mission. Uh, to go up north to the vicinity of Moncton where uh, there was a prison camp. Among those prisons were General Wainwright. Okay. From Korea to work? Uh, he was the first American that Wainwright saw. So Wainwright was, uh, was taken from he, after, he was the, death, taken after from the death Bataan. march. He, he was, was actually taken from the Philippines to the army that was left in Bataan. Uh, and, uh, he had been transferred to China, and he was skinny as, as a rail. Right. And um, um, the, the general asked him, the first general. The, first, the question the first general uh, the first question the general asked him was, "How am I considered?" And in America, and uh, uh, Lamont answered. Uh, you're considered a national hero, which gratified the general. My grandmother, my grandfather, always said that he, General Wayne White Wright was the greatest man he ever personally met in his oh, life. Oh, he was tremendously admired. Great, great man. So, all right. So the now, war actually at that time, um, uh, the, the uh, head of the communists, Mao Zedong. Uh, took advantage of the situation to uh, uh, take, uh, push his communist armies against the nationalist armies, who were, which were under Chiang Kai-shek. Right. And that began immediately. And each warlord in, in, in each uh, section of, of China took it on himself too to put his own nationalist troops or communist troops, whichever they were supporting. Uh, they had, into action too. So they rushed us out of China too fast. Our troops went out uh, within days of reassembling in Kunming. And now the troops you were working with were, were nationalist troops. They were. Uh, they, they, well, as far as we knew. As far as you knew. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. Yes. Uh, the soldiers we worked with didn't know too much about, about political groups. They, were just, they did what they were told. So the American, the OSS fellows, got, uh, were sent out as soon as they could reassemble them in Kunming. And uh, I, I stayed there till about October, and then I was uh, sent home too. But all you read about now are the fellows that were sent into China right after the war. They get, they get <laughs> all, all of uh, this interesting work to do. And they said they get you guys out of there. Uh, yeah, but they sent us out because we did hear action between our local uh, general around Kunming. He was fighting other troops who didn't go along with him. I don't know whether they were communists or not. But, uh, action began right away. There was bombing going on around Kunming. As soon as we got back, I got there a week or two after. Uh, action ended after the atom bomb. So back, let me just go back a bit to the European China thing. How did you get from France to China? Most of the fellows came by boat. Okay, through right. India? Through the western route. So uh, through the Suez? Going, uh, uh, fr going from this country. Actually, we were all brought back 
To the U.S.? To the U.S. Ah. After France. Okay. Then they went to China on the Pacific group. Okay. Uh, a small group. And then entered the, 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 uh, By then the Colonel Cox took with him. And uh, I went with that group. We flew, which was a delightful flight. And how did you, uh, where did you enter China from? Where did you? From uh, Burma or Chabua, a community, small community, community uh, which was a, a landing strip, okay, an air base. We flew from there over the hoop. hoop. Some of the, there wasn't room in planes on the planes to take them all. Some of them came up the um, uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail, but not the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The Burma Road. Yeah, Burma Trail. Burma Trail. Right. Which had been fought over so. Well, which of course I guess was part of what Chenault was doing with the Flying Tiger, was trying to protect that, right? Because that was the open the route yeah, from back right, then. Oh, yeah. So, okay, so that's how you, so you came back to the States and then from the States went via, via air? Uh, yeah, a couple, some, few of us went by plane. Most of them came by boat. Okay. But arrived there over there in uh, March. Now, when you were in France, were you, you guys weren't uniform troops, right? I mean, because obviously- We were in uniform all the time. You were? Oh, yeah. Even though you were behind the lines and- All oh, right, in uniform, with the American flag right on us. Really? Yeah, right. How interesting. Well, I guess that might have had some advantages if you ever got caught, right? More likely to be treated as prisoners yeah. of war well, than as spies. We were close to the Mackey. Each group that went in, uh, each each so-called section of 14 men and two officers uh, was attached to a Mackey crew, M-A-Q-U-I-S, standing for the uh, backwoods, uh, the forest. Okay. Resistance troops, uh, French troops, right. And. Uh, And you said when you were doing that, you guys were living in the woods. You, is that what did I understand you to say that when you were in France at that time period, you were, or, or were you living in people's houses? What was your? Uh, there were houses, there were homes in areas controlled by the Mackey. Okay. Right. So you lived in them, and we, two guys we, would be here, yeah, so on. It spread around different. Right. In the vicinity, but in different specific uh, uh, in places, the suburbs of the okay. small community. Okay. Right. And then in China, you, the, we you, could see the Germans by going to the main roads. Okay, but when you were in China, you were actually at a base, at, at, at least a, some kind of formal facility. You're saying you lived where the priest had been in there before. There were wooden buildings there with not much wood left. Okay, the Japanese had burned most of it up it's for just, warmth. Yeah, it was much as anything. It was a little bit of shelter, but, okay. uh, and some place you could say you're over there and you're over there. So it was some kind of organization. And I assume that the, the priests we're talking about are probably Europeans who were in China. Is that when you said, is that what you meant? You meant uh, Christian Catholic priest, oh, sure. or, or not, not Buddhist, not. So, so they were Europeans, right. so you had a little bit. Oh, sure, right. right, yeah. So uh, you come back, you, so you say in October, you, you came back to the States. That's right. And right. did you, yeah, you, from here you said you were still in in 46. So what happened to, when you came back to the States, what happened to I, the- I got home in time for Christmas. Okay. In, in Massachusetts. In 45. And-, and uh, Was that the first time you'd been home since you left? Or did you get to stop at home you, between France and China? France and China had a tremendous opportunity to take a course in tropical medicine at, at the uh, Army Medical Center. Washington. Okay. And uh, I, I came in very handy to mm -hmm. in South China. Yeah. Um, so this uh, was the first time you got to, to, to go home? Yeah. When I you did, went to the I end did, of the war? I did, I did get home at that point. Yeah. For a day or two. Okay. Right. And then you, so fine, you come back in October and you actually get to well, go. I had to go right back to Washington to take the course and talk about right. it. And then, and then went on. Shipped out ASAP. To uh, China. Right. And at the end, end of the war, I, well, it was the middle of January when my active duty officially ended. That, but then I stayed in the reserve. But then you were back really in the medical corps, no longer. The OSS right. kind of, the, the OSS as we knew it fades away before the CIA is created. 
Yes, that's right. I at least am I reasonable in saying that the the CIA has never well would not operate in that same sort of format with the sort of large unit. I mean, right, they right. seem tiny. 14, 12, 14 men seems like a tiny little unit, but is a lot larger probably than most of the CIA. Most of the fellows that went into the CIA from the o OSS had been in the intelligence part. Okay, of they were, but you said the SI. Right, but uh, uh, the operational group fellows, some of them went in, uh, Frizzell went into the CIA afterwards, and uh, a number of others did too. Uh, but the, uh, our fellows that were trained in uh, weaponry, demolitions, and so on, uh, went back into, into the, the regular army, the regular back, service. Back into the army, if they did anything. That's right. So then, yeah, and, and they came uh, part of the special forces. Okay. They already knew what okay. the special forces were being trained for, and a lot of which was training. Was ultimately they, they were being trained in, in the methods that we had just been applying. Right, I, and I a lot of the they would. I, Always felt that I was attached to that unit. Uh, I think you get so great. You jumped out of airplanes the and stuff. You, 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 you certainly you jumped out of airplanes and things like that. I think you still get some credit. I went for along that. for the ride, sure. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure some of those were, were exciting moments. Now you say here one of the things you told me about, and when you asked about decorations and so on, you were given a Legion of Merit. Was that for a specific action, or is that for your? No, uh, that was for individuals that did something uh, different, not connected, not connected with combat. <laughs> so, I don't know, I think that they uh, uh, had one left over or something or other, and I was the lucky one. I see, I see, uh-huh, uh-huh. You guys, you guys from your generation, the most modest group I've ever seen in my life. Gentlemen who I spoke to earlier today had a bronze star, and oh, they just gave them to all of us. <laughs> As, as I say, they were, they were a magnificent group. Uh, Cox himself was a terrific leader, great, a great leader. They would uh, follow him anywhere and do anything for him. Now, did you actually ever, did, did you meet or, or know Wild Bill Donovan? I've seen him, that's all. I saw him, that's uh, just in passing. So okay. That's all, right. And of course, Obviously, from the sort of where you were, you could, the, each people, each group is very independent, I assume, and whoever was in charge was. Nobody knew what anybody else was doing. No. So you came back to the states. You were, uh, did you? You went into the reserves after that, and I assume you went on with your medical. Well, I career? stayed in the reserve. Okay, stayed and you went on with your medical career after the war. Yeah. Um, I uh, joined a, a unit here. Uh, a medical unit, and uh, we used to go over to Fort Thomas to do physical exams. And we did have to go on act on two week periods of activity. That was your that was your your reserve duty. Make our points. So what did but what did you do for uh, personally? I mean, what was your career? You you were a doctor in in New England or here? Did you come here? Here, well, in Cincinnati. Okay. I started off as a after the war. I got more training in pathology. Then went into uh, a hospital in Massachusetts mm -hmm. and uh, had the opportunity to come out here to Cincinnati. And that's this is where I've been since 1952. Soon they we, soon they maybe treat you like a native. Now we now we can't now we can't leave the place. <laughs> uh, are there any other stories you you want to share? Or anything else interesting that that do you, unusual, fun, exciting that you would like to, to share while we're on this topic from your experiences? Well, uh, most of the Army fellows uh, would have experiences that I wasn't particularly interested in and vice versa. For instance, on the way over to China, we stopped in Calcutta and I visited the School of Tropical Medicine, which was well known, and met these Indian doctors that were great. And they treated me royally, and uh, one, oh, they showed me slides of diseases that they had there. One was uh, Kayla Azar, where they used to develop these tremendous limbs. 
and um, she gave me a slide, which I uh, treasured as long as I <laughs> kept it. You were really interested in your career field. That's wonderful. That's one of you had that kind of excitement about that sort of. Well, that, that's where I had a little bit of knowledge. Right, right. <laughs> More than in any other field. Except the sociabilities of the, uh, these fellows, they were great fellows. And we, the other fellows in the, in the OSS, in the, the, the gentlemen, OSS. the men you served with. Now there also were there women in the OSS? Was there like a subgroup? What did I'm just trying to remember? Didn't Julia Child wasn't she some involved in the language side of the OSS at one? Julia Child, the, the French chef, the am I, oh, Julia Child? Yes. Oh sure, she was in the OSS. Right. Okay. So there were there were definitely women involved as well. Right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, in in uh, office work. Right. Office work. Yeah. All they could use, all they could uh, get hold of there. Sure. And your experiences, uh, how did you feel about the, the French resistance? Were you impressed by the, the people you dealt with there? Very much so. Very much so. They were, they were very effective. They were, they were the truly loyal, uh, French French uh, soldiers, uh, the Mackies, and uh, there were some that were communists. Too. Right. Yes, of course, there was a big movement. But to the, us, the they were all the same. They all acted the same uh, toward us. I think the difficulty, the greatest difficulty, was in having them cooperate. With each other. In the, with each other. And. Uh, it wasn't just a political difference, but each uh, Frenchman, head of a head of a little group, uh, wanted to be the head of something bigger. And right. So they didn't get together too effectively. That was one of Cox's objectives to get more accomplished by them. And how about the Chinese? How did you feel about the the Chinese that you dealt with? Uh, those Chinese fellows were great. They, they were so anxious to, to do something. They, they were loyal, I, I suppose, to their own uh, friends. And uh, they, they got along, we got along well with each other. Right. Too. <clears throat> So you, I, were, you seem were, very impressed by I, the people across the board that you dealt with. That, that's greatly admired them. One of our jobs when I got over there was to help pick able, so-called able-bodied men from the troops that were there, that were in general uh, at that time inactive. And uh, on half a dozen trips, I would say, to surrounding areas in, in South China. Um, I would go and look at these hundreds of troops and test them so I would have an interpreter. And uh, I, I would have simple little tests and have the interpreter tell them uh, which way I was pointing. And uh, they might point some other direction. Trachoma, trachoma was rampant there. Their vision was terrible. Really? So out of several hundred men, you might be able to pick ten that were so-called really? able-bodied men. Oh my goodness. That could see and hear. Could function. And I understand mean, size. Base. Right, exactly. Much less talking about, talking about excellent physical specimens. Right. You mean guys who are just basically able to tell, function they, they were semi-autonomously. They were riddled with uh, local problems, they had uh, uh, skin diseases, we fortunately had loads of sulfur ointment so we could treat the uh, insects, and insects and whites that get into the skin. Right. And uh, their uniforms, were, and uh, also uh, uh, some of these insects would cause diseases such right. as mosquitoes carrying malaria. And, uh, Whites carrying relapsing fever, 
and various things, uh, and uh, put them on anti-malarial therapy. The, these poor fellows blossomed out into great soldiers. You wouldn't recognize them weeks. There's still a little bit of health. They got hold of them. And they were so loyal and so anxious to get ahead. They were so proud mm -hmm. to become uh, jumpers. And uh, I, I admired them tremendously. Right. I said, you've seemed very impressed by all the people. That's, that's, that's... We had some, uh, uh, I had a Chinese interpreter attached to uh, 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 the medical medics that we had, uh, half a dozen or so in each right. place, and Lin Cho Lin, 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 Lin Cho Sung, uh, a great fellow. He had been in St. John's University in Shanghai as a pre-medic. Okay. Uh, after, and he did a great job. And uh, after the war, we exchanged Christmas cards. And one year, his car came from North Carolina. He was in a medical school. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we kept up our conversation, our uh, communication, correspondence, and uh, uh, for years. And uh, he married. He had several children. They are all grown up now, of course. They're all winners. There. I was afraid what you were to tell me is that you, know, you either stopped hearing from him or the other assumption was you say we got the message from Taiwan instead. I didn't. He came all the way to the states. That's Tapes, right. Uh, 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 no, he he was in Shanghai. He was in Shanghai, yeah. and he had gone back to China, uh, Shanghai, and written from there. But he this particular Christmas he sent his Christmas card from from uh, Duke. Okay. So uh, he went into practice in Pennsylvania, Pittstown, Pitt something. Mm -hmm. And we visited him there. He had a nice home. Uh, he was highly respected. He was chief of the hospital that was there. Oh, my goodness. As well as doing he, surgery. Highly respected person. I'm sure. Deservedly yeah. so, it sounds great, like. Great, great. And uh, you're still involved with a, a group uh, of the former OSS guys. I'm. Well, You've told me a little bit about uh, that in the past. Yeah, it's gotten down pretty much to, to Christmas cards no. but uh, So there's still a couple of dozen of Do you know how large was the OSS during the war? Do you know any idea how many people were? In China, that kept coming over and over. In, in France, there were 150, about 150 of us. And that's the number that went over to China. But our numbers were added to constantly. So we got up to several hundred, as far as operational group fellows. And as you said, then, then from from some of those groups, especially from the SI, from the intelligence group, right. those were some of the first people who who became the CIA when it's founded in forty-seven or forty-eight. The date escapes me, but during the Truman administration, when the Central Intelligence Agency is founded, right. some of those people That's from that side, predominantly, went right. ahead and, and became the first um, CIA, CIA right. people. Um, for, um, we did so much talking we, when we got together. At one point, my, my grandson, who was uh, working uh, with a publisher in New Hampshire, he's now publishing himself, said if we'd write up our stories, he'd put them online. So he created a website for us, uh, www.ossog, <laughs> www.ossog. And dot org. we've written up all about our French operational group. Uh, we have sections in that on the uh, Greek, operational, Greek operational group, the Yugoslavians, the Norwegians. We're working on the uh, on the uh, Italian ones right now. My goodness, getting them online slowly. Oh, good. Yeah. So they they had a lot of good operations. They did all of the operational groups did great work. And certainly spread wide across just the places you just listed there gives an idea of the, the I'm just your own personal experience gives an idea of how wide a theater anybody involved with it. And I think it's very, my personal opinion, you, you make somewhat light of it, but I think it's very impressive. As a doctor, you could easily have been involved with, with a hospital, it possibly actually, you know, in Europe, in the war zone, and so on. 
which I'm not dummy to take anything away from that. That obviously would have been a fairly cushy in comparison to what a lot of people had to go through. And instead, you got involved with this group where you ended up paratrooping places and, and so on. And so I, I think you underestimate the, your own uh, moxie, if you will. This is a good New England term. Um, for, well, so. it was, it was, I must say, uh, a challenge, a lot of fun, <laughs> and most of the time. Well, trying to keep up with these fellows. Wonderful. Right. Anything else you want to add? Anything else you don't think you said that you'd like to share for, for this program? Well, uh, I want to emphasize the OSS was a great group. It's wonderful to be part of something like that, isn't it? To something that you can think back and go, it was, yeah, that was a great thing to do. It was oh, a great yes. group of people to be oh, with. Yes. And, oh, yes. and, and to be able to look back on those things with such positive feelings. That's right. Uh, I must admit, I didn't give it much thought in the years I was here in Cincinnati as a pathologist. And it's only since I've retired that we have uh, added uh, a lot of a little uh, work to our increased interest, in interest as we gather this information. Well, don't you think it's been the case with your generation to a large degree? Uh, most of the guys came back from the war and got on with their lives. You saw, you know, if you read history, after the Civil War, everybody wrote their story. Even after World War One, there's a lots and lots of people write their story about their experiences. World War Two. Guys were too busy going to college and getting married and starting their careers. You don't see as much of that immediately after the war that you saw in some of America's prior wars. Well, perhaps not. Perhaps not. Of course, their uh, numbers are very great. That is, number of veterans in World War uh, One compared to those in World War Two, which would amount to three million versus sixteen no. million, I believe. Right. And of course, the World War I veterans are all but gone now. So right? Another point about the information that we have, um, we've tried to obtain as much as possible information about uh, OSS uh, from the uh, National Archives. And uh, there's a branch of National Archives in College Park, Maryland, uh, which since the beginning of World War II has uh, been accumulating just military information. Right. And uh, I've visited that place several times. They have uh, buildings of information there. Based on what the oh, I did just while we're on that that uh, what the OSS became, which of course the CIA, a highly secret organization, because that's what it's designed to be. How available is information on the OSS? Did a lot of that kind of get absorbed and got? Uh, Kept uh, secret, or is most of that fairly is available? That very little is uh, still classified. Uh, most of most of what was done is on record at the National Archives. Right. Yeah. Terrific. That, that's my, my feeling. Okay. Well, John, thank you very much. This has been a pleasure. <laughs> this is Donald well. Cruz from the Delhi branch of the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County. We've been speaking to Mr. John Hamlet. Uh, doing part of a veterans interview about his experiences as a member of the OSS during World War II. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. <laughs>